Hi everyone, I'm Tina Lundquist Faust, co-president of Houston Pet Set. I'm joined today by my sister and co-president, Tama Lundquist. Thank you for joining our virtual conversation series, Houston Pet Set Conversation for the Animals. This is our fifth installment in the conversation series. If you're interested in seeing our previous interviews with Dr. Kleinberg or Shelby Babowski, president of THLN, please view our website or social media. Today, we're going to be talking about an important topic for the Houston rescue community, and that's fostering. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how those champions in our community step up and utilize their personal resources to benefit our area's companion animals. Our guest today is local foster and Instagram influencer, Katie Evers, who owns Katie's Foster Fam account. Katie is what we call a champion foster and does amazing work for our area's companion animals who need a little extra assistance. Katie, welcome to the conversation for the animals. How are you? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. I'm really excited to be here. Well, we're really excited to have you and um, it's a small world. It's interesting that we have friends of friends and know people um, from our past. So I love that about Houston. It seems like um, instead of six degrees of separation, it's more like two degrees. Um, tell us about yourself. How long have you been in Houston and how did you get into fostering, Katie? Yeah, so I moved to Houston for graduate school in 2014. And while there, I started um, volunteering for some shelters. And I actually had my very first foster in college as like an accidental, someone found a puppy and didn't know what to do with it. Somehow word went around and they were like, well, Katie likes dogs. So I ended up taking that dog in and being like, well, I'm about to move and have graduate school. I don't think, you know, I can keep it, but I'll get it vetted and then find a home. And, you know, little did I know at the time, but I was fostering the dog. Um, and then it happened again in Houston because someone had heard about that. So it started out really as me getting calls about dogs in need and taking them in myself, paying for that vetting and finding them homes. But after like, uh, after volunteering for shelters and hearing more about fostering, I researched a couple places and, and found one to foster through because, you know, paying for vetting as a graduate student was not something that I could do. And I knew that they really had so many more resources um, that I, that I thought would be really helpful for what I wanted to do there. Right. <clears throat> that fostering component is so important in our rescue community. Um, we know that without that, tens of thousands of dogs would never find homes because um, they need that time to, like you said, get vetted, get socialized, um, and just get kind of ready for their new forever home. So we're so grateful that you do the fostering. Can you tell us what kind of cases you do? What kind of foster cases you take on? Yeah, so originally I took whatever someone called me about. And one time my friend's a firefighter and they get a lot of dogs tied up at their, their um, station or dropped off at their station. And one this one dog I picked up was more of a medical case. And so I, I found my love, I guess, of medical cases then. So I now take mostly medical dogs. Um, I try and take ones that require a lot more time and attention and, you know, maybe require medicine multiple times a day, vet trips, things like that, because I do have um, the flexibility in my work schedule now to be able to do that. So I mainly take those medical cases. Some of them have mange, like skin conditions, I also consider my pregnant ones as medical as well. Uh, so I take a lot of newborns, things like that. Uh, so definitely medical that need that little bit of extra, extra love and time. So good of you. Thank yeah, you. So sweet um, because those aren't the easy ones and people might not understand if they're not familiar with Houston's um, problem with animal overpopulation, what a, a medical foster is. Um, it, we all know because we're so entrenched mm -hmm. in this that those are the cases of dogs that might be left on the street where they are either injured, dogs get shot, they get hit by cars, they become sick, they have um, skin issues, all kinds of things. And that those things can happen in the shelter as well. Um, we know that Houston has a crisis with regard to its animal overpopulation. What do you think? What do you think are the contributing factors to this crisis, based on your experience? Well, I think what you just said is a lot of it. Like, I think a lot of people don't know. Um, I think that there's a lack of, of knowledge or education on the Houston um, overpopulation and strays. 
And I don't think it's, it's even the people that do know that there's a problem, don't know how easy um, it is to help or how much, or even what to do to help. Um, I think a lot of times when people find a stray, if they end up not helping, it's because they just had no clue what to do. And they felt like they wouldn't have actually been that much help because they didn't know. Um, so I think that has a lot to do with it. I think that it also has a lot to do with the way that some people think of pets and you've been saying companion pets. And I think that's so important because a lot of people, um, in the area think of them more as, you know, an outside animal, or sometimes they think of dogs as being okay in the, on the streets and, you know, we feed it, it's okay, but I'm the one taking them in once they're on the streets and they aren't doing well, you know, they're, like you said, their skin starts to have issues. Um, or they get shot by getting on someone's property, um, things like that. And so I, I think that a lot of it is not knowing how bad it is and not knowing what to do to help. Also with, we need more resources. You know, we have so many people, so many strayed animals and our resources are just not higher than different areas that have that way less strays. You know, a lot of people have reached out to me and said like, Hey, I want to get my dog fixed, but I've called 50 places and I can't find an appointment, um, or one less than, you know, $500. So one that they can afford. So I think, you know, getting more of those resources is also super important and something that we're trying, but is still lacking here in the community. Agree with you on all those points. Well said. Yeah. With thousands of followers on social media, can you tell us what the response has been to some of the more challenging cases that you've brought in? Yeah. I mean, the response is something that I never expected. When I started my Instagram a couple of years ago, I started it to get my fosters adopted. Um, and it has turned into a community of support that I really never expected uh, with these medical cases that I do take on, you know, the rescues will pay for medical bills and things like that. But sometimes, you know, I want an extra blanket or extra nutrients for them, you know, special things that they could really use to help with comfort. And I've really gotten a community of like, can I donate a blanket or things like that? And not only that, but the reactions of wanting to adopt and wanting to know how they can help. And that has been incredible that from social media that these people have said, you know, I'm in a different state or a different city, but I want to do the same thing. How can I get started? Or in Houston, a lot of people have reached out and said, I didn't even know this was an option. So thank you for bringing it to my attention. Or I'm in Houston and I want to foster, but I always thought it was a three month long thing. And you're saying that I can find multiple different types of ways. So realizing that it's a community of people wanting to help um, in whatever way they can. And it's been really awesome. That's great. Wonderful. Well, with all the animals that you, all the dogs that you have fostered, do you have one that stands out as like your greatest success story? Oh gosh. Um, I feel like it changes every year, but my most recent would be Yukon. And that's because he was just very, you know, really, really sick, um, in, on the streets and people seriously thought he was a coyote. They were like, he's a mangy coyote, you know, was lacking hair. So they left him there for weeks thinking he was a coyote. And when someone finally sent me a picture, I was like, that's a, that's a dog. That's a small dog. Like, let's get him home. And he was, he was so, so awful looking with, you know, missing hair and just scared. And his eyes were almost swollen, fully shut. And after even a month, it turns out he had one bright blue eye and one like half blue and half brown. And people were like, did his eyes change color? But it really was just that his, he was so sick looking, you couldn't even see his eye color. And now he's fluffy and a husky mix and really, really sweet. So he's probably one of my like the biggest change that I saw. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. Is it ever hard to foster them and then let them go to their permanent home? Do you, and do you stay in touch ever? Yeah, and that's probably the number one question and comment that I get as well about fostering is, you know, how do we, or I don't foster because I get attached or do you get attached? And the short answer is yes, I get attached, right? I let out a few tears sometimes when they leave. Um, the long answer is that I do keep in touch with as many as possible. There's obviously going to be some adopters that it doesn't make them a bad adopter for not wanting to contact me constantly. And I never hold that against adopters, 
but I'll always push for it and encourage it. So I do end up getting a lot of, of updates and pictures, which is always makes my day. And I do, I do get attached, but I, with how many updates I've gotten and I see how happy they are, it's such a good reminder that that dog is perfectly happy in their new home. And now I can like save another and hope, help that one be just as happy in another home. I think that's the part that makes it easier is knowing that when you move one through your system, your own personal system and through the foster fostering um, time, then you can go get another one and you can help another one. And I, I've only fostered a couple of times in just very short amount of time, but um, it, it always helps to think, okay, yeah, now I'm going to go help another one and it just keep that process going. Otherwise it, it would be very hard. Um, okay. So um, what advice would you have to give to anybody who'd be interested in fostering? Um, the best advice I would have would be to do a lot of research and figure out for yourself what kind of fostering you want to do, because there's so many different kinds of fostering in the community, especially here in Houston. Um, you know, there's rescues that will let you foster only small dogs, only puppies, only big dogs, only, you know, if you want hypoallergenic, like there are need for fosters for all of those different kinds of dogs and for any amount of time. Like I tell people all the time, I'm like, if you sign up to foster for a rescue and you say you can only do short term, I go out of town sometimes and I would love a weekend foster for my fosters, you know, things like that. So I would say to really do some research and by research, I mean, just not, you know, no kill rescues near me or, you know, read up on websites, um, how they are looking for fosters, what kinds of fosters they need and submit applications to a bunch of different places and have those conversations with the rescue and figure out which one fits best with your lifestyle and, so figuring out the best way for you to help. And you're right about the number of different ways to foster. There are, you know, you can, you can do the medical fosters in the short mm -hmm. term. And it's not, sometimes people think, oh, I'm going to have this dog for three or four months or what if it doesn't find a home, but you can just bridge some of those, those gaps that the rescues need often. With regard to fosters, you know, you talk about all the different ways to do it. Um, it seems like there's a need in this community for some kind of centralized foster system. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about maybe with all your experience bringing together um, people that want to foster and pairing them with the, the right organization? I mean, that's definitely a, a great idea. And in a very small scale, I've tried things similar. Um, I have helped by adminning a few Facebook groups that are kind of just open-ended for people looking for either looking for help or looking to help. And I do a lot of bridging the gap of, you know, we can, I'll send you rescues that sound like it fits or I'll mentor. Um, and as being someone who has fostered for a lot of different organizations and someone who's not like with one in particular, I feel like it's, it's a good spot for me to, you know, help them as the foster and I'm not like pushing a certain rescue on them kind of thing. Um, but that's, I mean, that's a wonderful idea and something definitely to consider of, you know, why is there not a centralized, Hey, I want to foster. I can go here and right. see what all to do next. Right. Good. Well, maybe something we can talk about in the future. Is Absolutely. there anything else? Is there anything else you want to share with us before we sign off today? Any other stories, suggestions, oh, ideas? I want to ask her, I want to hear yeah. from you, Katie. So for people who are listening out there and maybe on the fence about fostering, can you just reiterate kind of how important it is to have these fosters and how important it is for our whole rescue community and our community? Yeah, absolutely. So I think when some people think of fosters, they think of it as like independent rescue. And that's just not, not what we, um, what I'm talking about with fostering, right? I'm talking about being just a safe space for an animal um, when with the rescue completely backing you and being like a temporary safe space for them before they go to their forever homes. And it's so important and adopters are so important and awesome and amazing. But if every single person adopted only and never fostered, then there would still be so, so many dogs in need. Um, I'm on foster in the 180s now. And I think about that all the time with, I, you know, if I kept the first five, that's 180 dogs that I wouldn't have been able to save. Mm -hmm. So while it's so hard to let them go, it's definitely like fostering is such a vital role that 
we need so many more of because every single time I think about, Hey, if you, you know, if you opened your home for a week, maybe while I'm in between fosters or that person has a dog that leaves in a week, you know, there's an exponential amount of cases like that. And so if people could open their homes for any amount of time, we're talking saving, you know, thousands of more dogs a week kind of thing. And, and yeah, it's just, uh, it's can be a simple role. It can be as, as time consuming as you want it to be, or as, as easy. And the best part is because they're temporary, you can always take breaks. You know, you can say, I've had a lot of dogs in my house. I need a week to myself. And you can always reach out to other fosters for mentoring. And, and if you ever, you know, really can't handle it, you can reach out to the rescue because it's one of those things where you're not alone. You're not doing this, that I picked up a dog off the street. I'm stuck with it kind of thing, which sounds bad, but you know, in different situations. Um, and so if you pick up a dog, but you're with a rescue, then you always have that support and they need that. They need somewhere for you to go and they can do the other work for it. They, but they can't keep saving them. They cannot take animals from the shelter if they don't have somewhere for them to go. We're constantly getting, you know, like tagged in posts, you know, this dog's going to die. This dog needs a rescue. This dog needs a foster and rescue see those tags, but they cannot do anything if they don't have somewhere for that dog to go. You make such a good point in that those animals are stuck in that shelter and there's two options for them. They're going to go to a rescue or they're going to be euthanized. And if the rescue doesn't have the foster, then they can't take them, right? But if they have the foster, then that dog gets to get out. It gets to, to spend two to three weeks with their foster. And then it goes on to its forever home and it's saved. But without that, you're right. Many more dogs uh, would be euthanized without the fosters. And dogs are being euthanized today because we don't have that that um, foster system that we need to, or as many fosters as we need to, so. Absolutely, I have you know some good relationships with rescues now where I know not to send them a dog unless I can foster it because I know their hearts and I know they wanna save the dog and they will provide the vetting. They have the, you know, the donations and they can make it happen. But if they don't have anywhere for that dog to go, they just can't take it. Well, with transport now too, with so many organizations transporting, there is an end date. You know, yes. so many of the, the dogs, they already know going into the foster home that in two weeks, it's going on the bus, it's going on the plane, or it's getting in the van, and it's going to its forever home in Colorado or Minnesota or the Pacific Northwest. So a lot of those transport um, groups now make it easier to foster, I think, because you do have that end date in, in sight. Absolutely. And I fostered for those as well. And I think that the hardest part for people is not always getting to see the ending as much as they could in Houston. And I would love to take this opportunity to point out like to, you know, when I fostered some that go to Colorado and things like that, I think it's important for people in Houston to know that the dog situation in those states is not like it is here in Texas and especially Houston, right? They don't have these strays, their shelters are empty. They have wait lists and wait lists of amazing adopters just waiting to save dogs so much so that rather than going to breeders, even though they have to wait a year, these adopters will wait months and months for a Texas dog because they want to help. And so like I had a mom and puppies just last week that were saved um, from Cleveland here in Texas, um, the city of Cleveland, and they, you know, are already now in Colorado. And as soon as they're old enough, they have wait lists of adopters ready for them. So rather than, you know, and, and because I only had them a week, I now have another mom and puppies. So rather than having those for eight weeks until they were old enough, I had only one week with them. And now I know they're safe and I have another mom and litter that I got to save. So that transport, you know, saves, you know, an exponential amount there because it has eight weeks that I can keep saving more as well. So that tra the transport options are, are really awesome now. And people um, maybe don't understand that a foster home is so much better for a dog than a shelter. They think, why can't we just shelter all of these? Dogs don't thrive in a shelter system and they do thrive in foster homes because they're socialized, they can relax. The shelters are not a good place for them. It's stressful. They don't get the interaction that they need. Um, they probably don't get the, the good quality food. So that's why foster homes are so important. Those dogs get off the street and so many of them just come into your home and sleep. 
for days because they can decompress, they're safe, and they don't have that kind of same opportunity in the shelter system. It's just that they're not, they're not on the street. So homes are really important for socializing and setting up a dog for success um, for their next, their next home. Yes. And I have Mm -hmm. two dogs and a cat of my own. And that helps bring out a good point too, because it's wonderful. I get to help socialize them. And also I know a lot of people are worried about fostering when they have their own animals. Um, but my animals have always had, you know, I've, I'm very particular about making sure I properly introduce, which is a lot easier said than done. Um, you know, I do what's called pack walks where I'll take them leashes near each other, not immediate introductions. And I do, um, but I let my fosters decompress because like you said, Tina, when I bring them home from the shelter, most of the time they want to sleep for a couple of days right there. They need that time to decompress. Um, and then not only do I get to socialize, you know, I get to socialize them with my dogs and my cat, but if they are not friendly, it's, I can separate. Usually I've had very good experiences with being able to separate and kennel train them as well. Um, and then it makes them so much more adoptable. Like you were saying that I can now put on their, you know, little resume. I can say they are cat friendly and dog friendly. And when they go to these new rescues, that's awesome. And you would have no clue. A lot of times, especially with dogs like mom dogs, um, you know, it makes sense that they're protective of their puppies. They're in a shelter. There's dog bark, dogs barking everywhere. And when I bring them home, they're just sweet and loving. And I've never had a mom that I couldn't um, interact with after giving them a little bit of time to decompress and same with dogs that I've brought back from the shelter, you know, with giving them that time, maybe they were barking and growling in the shelter and it's just terrifying. They don't know what's happening. We, you know, we pulled them off the street maybe. And they're like, why am I, you know, stuck in here now? And once they learn that you're the one feeding them and giving them love and they learn that you're good, then they really become totally different dogs. It's it's so rewarding, you know. I, it's it's hard to let them go, but um, once you see them thriving and living out really good lives, it it's, makes you want to go get another one. For sure. When I've had litters go, I got you know I had one litter. It was my first ever litter to have from the day they were born until they transported, and so it was really hard to let them go. But one of those adopters, this was three or four years ago. And one of those adopters still, I follow on Instagram and I see, you know, him all amazing and healthy and happy. And also in the snow, she sends lots of videos of him in the snow. And I'm like, that dog is living the life. (laughs) Definitely always makes it easier to let them go that way. Katie, thank you so much for joining us today and providing us with this perfect opportunity to brag about our area's fosters. Um, There's so many out there doing really great work and we thank you as well. To the audience at home, please reach out to us if you have any questions about today's conversation or if you would like to get involved with future efforts. We'd love to be able to help you. Thank you all. All right, thank you so much for having me. And if you have any questions for me as well, my Instagram handle is at Katie's Foster Fam. Bye Katie, thank you. Bye, Bye. Thank thank you. Thank you.